backstage, you're already here. Hello, hello. This is um, Sydney in a major scene known as Extravaganza. Hello. Um, <laughs> you already know. You already know. Um, and Sydney knows the scene here, has seen the changes of the scene here, and uh, wants to read something for y'all. Uh, thank you so much. And first I want to start off um, just by saying um, just how grateful I am for this space that you've created on um, this whole entire weekend. I think it's just been so beautiful, truly, to celebrate Vaughn, his legacy, um, and also just to see the growth of the scene. I mean, I was here 10 years ago, which is hard to imagine. Yeah, I know. Still moist. Um, but how you doing? How you doing? Nah. That was my favorite German word when I lived here. Nah. I learned, because I took like a Goethe Institute class in San Francisco before I came here, and we only learned Vigatus Deer, and then I had to learn very quickly, nobody says that. <laughs> it's all nah. But then whenever I say it, I always feel a little like a creeper, but um, it always comes out weird. But that said, um, you know, when I, when, uh, so he uh, approached me and said, hey, we're looking to do this panel. I was kind of reflecting of like, hmm, what can I offer? What can um, you know I offer to this like altar that we have to such great voices? Um, and even listening to the speakers today, um, just thinking about how inspiring everyone's words are. Um, I just wanted to kind of ground us a little bit, and I was thinking about okay, we you know we've been given these incredible and just super important statistics, um, great information, also just sort of. You know, I feel like this conversation was just a very beautiful one about um, sort of where the scene is right now around a lot of these questions. Um, and I, I hope, I, I want to put this out there, I hope we can link some of those things perhaps in the Paris Ballroom TV YouTube channel so we can access all those things. But um, I was thinking today, huh, what could be something good for this? And um, as some of you may know, um, Besides being a, a voguer, somebody who's in the ballroom scene, who's walked realness in other categories, um, I also work as a TV writer and producer. I was a co-EP on a show called Legendary, which you probably know. Thank you. It was many, many things. Um, but I had a lovely co-writer uh, who was also a co-EP, co uh, the icon Jack Mizrahi. And it was interesting because I remember when we were doing season one, um, and that was out in Stamford, Connecticut, which is super cold in January. <laughs> um, and we were trying to, they asked us, they were like, you know, we need something for the super teaser. So for TV, you know, before you watch the episode, especially a first episode of a first season of a show, um, usually there's like this one minute thing where they like chop up all these, you know, swooshy clips to kind of give you a flavor of what this show is gonna be about. And obviously for us, the big question was how do we adapt this incredibly huge and expansive culture you know, that's done so much, that has all this history, how are we gonna shrink this down into a 60 minute format for you know, mass consumption, truly, worldwide? And I remember like, they were like, yeah, we need to have a way to explain what all of this is. Um, yeah, can you do that in like one minute? <laughs> and it was like, uh, I don't know, but I guess we'll find out. Um, so I remember I went home, I kind of came up with this poem, this idea that came about, and uh, as per usual, it was very interesting working with Jack, I would call it um, beautiful chaos in a certain way, <laughs> um, because the way we would kind of sometimes work, it's like, you know, if he had an idea, I would give notes on it, I had an idea, he'd be like, oh, no, we need to add this, this, this. Um, so. This was kind of the idea that we um, came up with together because when you're a writer, you go through multiple, multiple drafts and it's not just us, it's a network that has notes, it's a studio that has notes, it's some EP with a chip on their shoulder who has notes. So all this said, um, I kind of wanted to do this as like an invocation, a sort of one minute teaser, a super teaser of what this is. <sighs> so this was the script and just so I said for uh, we had the different competitors read for the show. The ballroom scene is a community. It's a community made of chosen families, a community made of houses. Houses are your families. They're your friends, your confidants, your sisters, your brothers, your mothers, your fathers. Ballroom gave me a family. 
Ballroom taught me how to be me. Ballroom taught me self-love. Ballroom showed me acceptance. Ballroom gave me motivation. Ballroom made me competitive. Ballroom gave me a voice. Ballroom saved my life. Ballroom is the birthplace of Vogue. The ballroom community is where you get your lingo from, the tea, the shade, the nerve. And no, it wasn't RuPaul. Sitting, eating, serving, darling, show wham, not shablam. The laughs are good because we also have that in there too. Uh, ballroom is creativity. Ballroom is historic. Ballroom has a legacy. Ballroom was founded by black and Latina transgender women. It started with the drag queens back in the day. That's right, we did that. Crystal LaBeja, the first mother, look at her makeup, it's terrible. She wasn't a friend of yours, darling, she was a friend of mine, classic. Dorian Corey, Avis Pendarvis, Pepper LaBeja, Paris Dupree, Angie Extravaganza, all iconic mothers. Ballroom is competition. Ballroom is rivalries. Ballroom is battles. Ballroom is about house supremacy. Ballroom is about category domination. Ballroom is about having the nerve to compete. Ballroom is about getting your tens. Ballroom is about feeling it and leaving it all on the runway. Ballroom is fashion. Ballroom can be shady. Ballroom is winning trophies. Ballroom is the house of St. Laurent. Yeah. Of course. There we go. Somebody got it. Ballroom is the house of West. Ballroom is the house of Balmain. Ballroom is the house of Lanvin. Ballroom is the house of Escada. Ballroom is the house, the gorgeous house of Gucci. Ballroom is the house of Ninja. Ballroom is the house of Ebony. Ballroom is legendary. 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 So. Give it up. Give it up. Thank you so much. <laughs> just have a couple quick things, if I may. Not to take too much time. Um, I just wanted to ground us, one, to remind us of the trans mothers who created this space. All of those names that were mentioned. Um, they created this space for us and we walk in their legacy. Um, for me, it's very important uh, to acknowledge that I would not exist in the form that I am as a trans man, as a proud trans man without ballroom. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that it's the work of allies in our community, people like you, people like Georgina, who are here and support the space and support those of us who don't have families to go home to because families come in so many different forms. I know for uh, a lot of us, especially with this conversation that we just had, um, there are these issues, there are these questions. I want you all to remember, conflict is not a bad thing. I'm gonna say it again. Conflict is not a bad thing. It says that there's a question that we have in our culture and our community that needs an answer. And we don't have the answer yet. To me, this whole conversation was, we're trying to figure out where do non-binary identities fit in our community? Where do trans identities fit in our community? How are we responding to the times that we live in? This is a very important time to, to ask these questions and to really think about that. Um, so I just wanted to say, Again, I'm just so grateful to see all of these incredible faces. I do wish I saw more Butch Queen faces from last night. And one thing I want to encourage you all, one, check up on your trans and non-binary friends. A lot of us make it look very easy. And baby, it is not. Thank you so much for sharing this. I would now like to invite um, if she's here, I don't know if she's here now, but Mandla007, if you are in the building, then please come to the stage. Is she here? Yes. I want to have more noise for Mandla agreeing, coming to the stage. I 
also would like to welcome Gina Comme de Garçon to join us on stage. And then um, it's a great honor for me to uh, welcome to icons, fathers and mothers. And uh, I would like to um, ask icon Shady Prada to join us. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. And then, last but not least, I would like to welcome Mother Baby, Comme de Garçon, to join the stage with us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to direct my first question to you, Donna. <laughs> um, and as we talked a lot about now, uh, gender non-conforming and especially non-binary identities in ballroom. I would like to know for you as a gender non-conforming trans feminine body in a culture that celebrates binary aesthetics even when it comes to trans bodies, what would you say ballroom has missed or is missing to cater to the growing part of the community that no longer wants to uphold these binary systems? Uh, hi. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to Sophie and the House of St. Laurent for creating such a conducive space to be able to have conversations and communicate the things that we need to communicate to everyone. So round of applause for Sophie and the House of St. Laurent for creating the space today um, and for bringing like multiple opinions together to be able to talk. Um, yeah, firstly, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mantla, I'm 25 years old. I live in Berlin, I'm a multimedia performance artist, uh, and I've been here for the past three to five years. I just like to say that because before trans people come on stage and kind of have conversations about the things they're going through, you all kind of see us as, as statistics before real people, and each person on the stage like does something, lives a life, like some kind of food, is into some kind of movies. We're not just like death in numbers or our oppression on stage. So before we get into that, my name is Manza. <laughs> I'm 25. I'm a multimedia performance artist. If you want to book me, I'm very bookable. Um, <laughs> Right, so uh, to go into the question that was asked, I think a very important factor around people's sensitivities to my identity or other people's identities too is just being informed about it. I think one thing I have realized too is people like to have conversations around being informed, but none of you actually are. I'm not sure all of you can name a femme queen outside of a ballroom space or a ball that you know personally or is integrated into your life. I don't think any of you guys know trans people who are not from a Western context or trans people from Africa or from the Global South who've been killed this year, none of y'all can name a name, I'm sure. Um, so there's these ideas of being informed that we claim to be, but when it comes to my body in the space, none of you, are, not none of you, but a lot of people aren't doing the work to actually try and meet me halfway. Um, it was very difficult coming into the ballroom scene because I'm a trans person from Zimbabwe, which is a very different country from, you know, the spaces a lot of people are from. You know, there's access to hormones, there's access to a lot of cosmetic surgeries to change people's appearances, which is also, I think, a relation to how well you fit those beauty standards. I'm like a bigger <laughs> girl from Zimbabwe. It's very difficult for me to pass as an idea of what it is to be this uh, very binary, uh, generic, you know, woman, even after going through a lot of these changes. So when I came here, I came here from Zimbabwe without access, and then kind of being thrown into a space where it was expected for me to have access. It was expected for me to kind of find all the answers to all the questions that other people had around me. And it was very difficult, and I am really grateful right now to be in a space because of people like Sophie and other people who see uh, gender non-conforming and trans feminine people in our space, um, that I am now the German mother of the International House of Love. Bravo. 
And I'm very grateful to be able to be in this space, like my sister, Ivy Porosa, and so many other houses where we have these people in these positions. But it's been a very, very hard battle for the past like four years of kind of being in balls, just always being there, constantly showing myself and representing myself, being chopped or not going very far, or having very difficult conversations. I think for a lot of non-binary and trans people too, we love having these beautiful panels, but I have histories with a lot of people on these panels who've come to me before, after balls, have told me to shave because it's disgusting to see my body here on stage, have told me to you know, wear specific things. I've had conversations with people in private spaces where there's been a lot of violence and a lot of assault because butch queens and other people just don't want to meet people halfway. So what I would say to everyone too, I think which would like eradicate a lot of the issues we have is if people can really just take the time 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of your day to actually read up on what the fuck is happening. Because if we bring a mic to everyone in this audience, not a lot of you can say much, but you're in all of the talks, you're here, we have friends who are trans, but none of you know anything about what's happening. So I woke up today and it's been a really long weekend. I don't know how everyone is feeling. Um, and I was really excited to come here, but I'm also very tired and I'm exhausted. And as a trans person too, I was thinking, I'm gonna have to come up on the stage and kind of lay myself out for everyone to be like, ah, oh, baby, really? And then leave and not actually do anything about it. So I think also while everyone is also on the stage tonight, it's really important for everyone to do the work themselves and to find these resources. Google is very free and I'm tired of coming into balls and non-binary face is happening and no one knows how to judge it. And I'm tired of going into balls where there's six siren categories and there's non-binary and gender non-conforming people walking and it seems like the first time you'll have fucking seen it. It's not the first time. And I come from Africa, so I know there's a lot of ideas of one, what Western transness is, but gender non-conforming and non-binary people have lived in my culture for a very long time time. So when you speak of histories of black trans people, I am there whether you want me there or not. Yes. Yeah. Gina, um, next question I would like to direct to you. Maybe you can give us some context in terms of gender studies and the biggest misconception society, especially academia in that case, and people in general have about transness. To understand a little bit like um, what these misconceptions come from and how they are being reproduced into society. Hello, hey, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm here for the academic perspective today even though I can also give my lived experience in ballroom, but I'm trying to give, like, yeah, I'm trying to point out what I think is happening in academia concerning transness. And um, what I always think about is that transness in academia is almost always used to prove a point. It's not really for us. It's just, oh, we need something to, challenge, uh, challenge uh, sex and gender or heteronormativity or uh, white supremacy is like, oh, there's a trans person. Let's exploit them and put them in our research papers to prove a point. And then everyone reads it and finds it inspirational. And um, then it continues. <laughs> and I think this is the biggest misconception about trans in academia that we're, even though they call us subjects, we're not, we're purely objects and most of the time, it's um, research is uh, done by taking interviews or investigating trans lives. And yeah, that's basically just exploitation because most of the times no one gets like um, mentioned in the, in the uh, research papers or paid. It's just taking and proving a point. Yeah, maybe that's it. Thank you so much. Um... Yes, we talked a lot about um, the pressure of passing tonight. Um, I want to direct my next question to you, Shady. You are an icon in a category that is all about passing. There has been a lot of conversation about realness in the last years, where the point has been brought up that the existence of this category itself might oppress trans people who do not pass or do not pass as well or do not aspire to pass at all. And maybe um, it is important to also explain the history of realness and why this category 
is still so important to this culture in general, but also to some individuals who walk this category, that are also trans people that walk this category, that really hold on to this category, need this category. So maybe you can give some perspective on like how this comes together. How you doing? You can hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Shady Prada from the United States. I'm 54. I've been a ballroom for 30 years now. I walk trans man realness. Um, louder, please. Louder, please. Louder, please. Um. Yes. <laughs> That's what Thank I wanted you. to hear because, a lot, sorry, but a lot of people are like, um, yeah, uh, after two minutes, like, ah, uh, I've, I've been doing so much in ballroom, da 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 da. I'm not gonna recognize. And I'm like, you know, like this is a round of applause. It's giving like almost like a longer walking experience than some of you have walked this earth. So recognize it when it's here. Sorry, but yeah, proceed the question, realness. Uh, to answer a question, um, category, I quote the originator of the category because I wanted to give you exact history. So Larry Prothor is the overall father and the founder of the House of Ebony. He's told me that the first time that the realness category was walked was 1978 in New York City. It was at Pepper LeBeige's Ball. Um, why realness? And I want him to expound on why realness because he said um, him being a gay man, black man in New York and living in Brooklyn, New York, he couldn't walk around and act feminine. He had to look real. So the it was more or less um, what, we, what we call the United States, mama can't tell, papa can't tell. So he had to go navigate through the streets of Brooklyn in the Bronx in these urban areas, rough areas where, uh, you know, not gay friendly at all. So him, I wish I had a picture of Larry, uh, but if you could look him up on Facebook. Um, he couldn't look feminine. Uh, he would be beaten up. So that's why the category came about, the schoolboy, and it um, evolved into a uh, schoolboy realness, looking like a schoolboy. Then it evolved into executive, looking like a Wall Street executive. Um, then you had the pretty boy um, realness, you know, the pretty boys that can pass and still get through the neighborhood. So the realness category was about survival, basically. Surviving to, uh, the streets and uh, the urban areas where these guys had to still get home. And why is it still important today? So I started walking Butch Realness, and uh, I'm gonna piggyback off the uh, what you were saying about the non-binary. Create your own space, you understand? Because uh, we had a lot of problems with separating the Butch category from trans men categories at first, with the evolution of the trans men coming out more. So. The non-binary is basically going through what you are going through now. And I apologize for anybody in boardroom that ever disrespected you or not understanding because a lack of knowledge is what the problem is. So by you teaching, it, it'll help because it's new to us too, but we're open to it. You understand? So I wanted to apologize to anybody that's been uh, disrespected because we didn't understand. Okay? So basically, realness, um, like I tell people, um, it was about safety. So a lot of people take it um, passing. It was about, it's, it's mostly about safety and getting home, especially with our sisters um, in America. As you can see, we have a high rate of black and Latino trans women being killed. So it's about being, being able to navigate through life. Um, to, to give you the exact words from the, um, the originator of realness. It's not about validation anymore in ballroom. It's about survival. Because a lot of people, you know, I can speak on my transition. I didn't have any problem. I was working as a, 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 male, a correction officer in a male facility for 27 years. And I went through my transition, my medical transition through there. And I, I never had a problem because I always looked as I do now just without hair, you know. But a lot of people are not as passable as I am. Um, and what I would say to them is like, you know, you have to walk in your own strength and your own truth and 
navigate through life the way that's comfortable for you and give a, a like I would say middle finger or a, a more we, we're from the un, unapologetic um, area in Ballroom that's the black area where we didn't give a fuck basically about what anybody thought we just lived lived out loud and that's the advice I would give to you guys and girls I want to direct my next question to you, Zanine. Um, because it feeds a little bit into the realness um, topic. Because you are, are a writer, as you already explained to us. And um, a few years back, you wrote this very interesting article, which in the ballroom community then was shared everywhere and everywhere. Controversy, was like, darling. Yes, it was like, Interesting. oh my God. Interesting, that was very, that was very polite what of you. What did Sydney say? It was a scandal. What does it mean? The, it so if you want to know, if you don't know the article, when was it, 2016 or 2019, something? 2019, October, actually. Really? Ironically, it's probably the uh, anniversary of that right yeah. now, too. But this article, is said, um... Uh, you wrote, so the article was titled, Has Ballroom Outgrown Realness? And you talk about, uh, uh, in this article, you are also talking about gratifying experience, the gratifying experience of finally getting praised for your masculinity and getting praised for passing. Um, however, you also stated that realness could be a powerful category if it would emphasize less on aesthetics and more on character. Can you elaborate a little bit on that for us? All right, you want to get into it. Are you guys ready to get into it? Yeah. No, 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 I want to hear it again. Are you ready to get into it? Yeah. All right, let's go. So, right, that article was in the New York Times, which is a very big deal. It's very hard to get published in the New York Times, darling. And Why are you not clapping? I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> The girls are still gagging that it was in the New York Times, and the girls are still gagging that a, a trans man in our community wrote that. Because the shade is, a lot of people have tried to read me before they read the article, okay? It's true. Now, I really appreciate um, you stating to sort of like state our positionality here as trans folks on this stage. As you know, I'm from the United States. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. I moved out here to Germany in 2011. I was on a DAD scholarship in my previous life. I worked in public policy. I was all about energy environmental policy. I still am. And uh, I fell into the ballroom scene when I took a class from Georgina 10 years ago during the Berlin Voguing Out Festival. Okay? And one thing I want to say about that Back then, I was a cute little butch. I had a little curly top, curly little hair. And I was one of those, you know, people, probably like some of you, who were like, mm, I don't know if I should do a workshop. I was too embarrassed to even walk a ball, right? Like, I, the ball thing, I could not do, although I did go. I remember Hector, um, uh, God bless the dead. Uh, he was here, Hector Extravaganza. And, you know, and he, he was teaching folks. He was really, you know, he would stop the ball because people didn't, always understand the rules and he had to explain things. Um, so I remember being there and really Georgina, honest to God, was the first person to see me before I saw myself. It's so hard. I know. It's just been a crazy journey. She, she in the back crying. I know, and she knows because I remember back then, uh, Vogue Femme was the hot category. And I really wanted to do that. And I just didn't know how. And I was like, you know, I remember going to um, Tanz Motions at the Moritzplatz uh, for Virginia's workshop. And she walked us through all the categories. We did old way, new way, posing, European runway, all American. And I remember back then, I remember back then, you know, one of the great things about Georgina as a teacher is she will always first point out what you did right before giving you the critical feedback, which is the, the key to giving any kind of criti critical feedback in a creative zone. 
And I remember she said to me, she was like, after the workshop, she was like, you know, you're really good at the masculine stuff. And I said at the time, as a little butch lesbian, a little baby dyke, I was like, I know, that's the part of me I'm trying to fix. Because I saw it as a problem, and I saw it as a failure. Because I saw myself as a failure in femininity, which was the message I'd been given by my family, it was the message I'd been given by society. And when Georgina actually saw the beauty in me, and she asked me to bring it out, it completely shifted my worldview. Because for once, I found a space where I was celebrated and where I wasn't seen as a problem to fix. And it's important for me to share that, to share the journey, because I think some people, they see my credentials today, Ivy League education, magna cum laude, London School of Economics, Sciences Po Paris. I speak French fluently, I speak German. I've been around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? I've been in all of these rich, white, privileged institutions where a person like me should have never been, okay? And the only reason, the only reason I was able to survive in those institutions was because of this community, because of people like Shady Prada, Sean Coleman Ebony, Marquise Balenciaga, the trans men in our community, the icons who came before me, who paved the way and showed me that it was possible, okay? So I, I wanna start with that. But to get to your point very quickly, because I know we don't have a lot of time. When I walked Charlie Ebony's ball back in 2015, I was stuck in Paris. I was trying to go to London for the second half of my masters. And I remember he did this back to school ball. And the theme, you know, there was a butch realness category. It was the first time they, because we all know, butch queens love to do stuff for whom? Butch queens, yes. themselves, right? So there was a butch realness category. At the time, it was in the House of Ultra Omni, Marina, Caroline, they both were like, Sid, you're gonna turn it, this category's for you. And I said, okay, you know, whatever. I read the category, it was thug realness. You gotta bring it like a racaille, if you're French, you know. The girls who don't know, it's basically those banjo boys you see on the RER, on the RER, with their sweatshirts and the pumas and the gelled hair and all that. And I used to go to the boxing gym outside of the city in Aubervilliers, which is in the, it's the hood, but you know, it's a cute hood, okay? <laughs> and I used to go because, listen, I'm from the suburbs. I did not, I did not grow up in the Brooklyn or the Bronx, babes. I grew up in the nice suburbs. Not the nice, nice suburbs, but nice enough. So for me, I was like, okay, cool. I know these guys. I know them at the gym. Bam. I, my mind was so focused on, okay, I just want to win a trophy. I didn't even recognize the kind of opening that moment had for me because it opened something in me when I walked. Because Marina, she told me, she said, all right, Sid, keep your hood up. I had my pen sweatshirt, my little Ivy League sweatshirt, had my little cute gray sweatpants. And she said, okay, keep the hood up, but then when you get to the middle of the runway, pull it back. And I said, okay, cool. Charlie's on the mic, 10 9 anybody walking. I don't see anybody, I go out. I start walking. The moment I hit the floor, people started applauding. And it was the first time in my life, okay, that, again, I was ever celebrated for who I actually was, okay? And when I got to the middle of that runway and I pulled back that hood, I saw the judges panel, and you know the girls in Paris are shady. They, yeah, mm-hmm, girl. I saw Mother Rita get up and applaud, and I said, wow, okay, something, something was released in me. Something, something came out of me that could not go back in. And that was the moment that I realized, wow, okay, this, this body, that the cis body I thought I had, mm, this isn't working anymore. And by the time I got to London, I knew I needed to transition. So I say that to say 
it opened up something in me and I see the power of it because I was maligned by my family for so long, for so, so long. Society, for so, so, so long. We talk about homophobia, we don't talk about lesbophobia because when you're a lesbian, you are also treated like shit in the society, let's be real. We are all treated differently for so many things, okay? And I remember, I remember just being like, wow, wow, this is an incredible feeling and seeing trans guys who, who looked beautiful, because straight up, when I saw people like Shady or Sean Marquise, beautiful, because I was like, the impression I had of transness was, I didn't want to transition. I had to be dragged out of the closet, okay? I had to be dragged out of the trans closet. Shout out to Charlie Laban Schreer in the Netherlands. He was the one who saw me, trans guy. He was an omni. And I remember I was so afraid because the thing was, the way that I saw trans people at the time, they were always complaining. They were always complaining on Facebook. And I, they were always like, ah, I had this microaggression, somebody misgendered me, da 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 da. And I remember thinking like, you know what? That's not my brand, that's not me. I'm fun, I'm happy. I don't wanna transition because then I'm gonna be sad. Then I'm gonna be miserable, you know? I don't wanna be on Facebook just reading people down all the fucking time, I got shit to do. So it took a minute though to realize when I actually connected with trans folks, there's so much beauty, there's so much power in our existence, in our essence, in our being, in our beauty. All of this work that everybody is doing, we are uncovering the truth because it's been stolen from us, as, as they said er, uh, earlier, right? So for me, I saw the power and the beauty of it, but then at the same time, I saw the other side of it. Because when I moved back to the US, because I was stuck in London, I couldn't get access to hormones, the system was a mess, my, my doctor was transphobic as fuck. I was like, fuck this. I can go to New York. I have so many trans friends there who had an easy transition. Let me just do that. And then when I got there, yeah, things were, things were cooking. But then in the ballroom scene, I noticed, uh-oh, there are these questions about the pressures, about how one should look, how one should feel. And mind you, read the article before you try and read me. The way that I wrote that article, I was very, very clear. I said, some people say this, some people say that. I felt like this. Here are some ideas about where this could lead us, right? And I, I really wanted to put that out there because it's important for us to acknowledge it, for us to have ownership over our own experiences, especially in ballroom, because everybody wants to film, everybody wants to like do the little docu-series about the community, but very few people from the community actually get to narrate our own experiences, okay? And I am a hundred and a bajillion percent about knowing your worth and owning your worth and your work, okay? Because at the end of the day, we are powerful, we are beautiful, we are creative, we are beyond in so many ways, okay? So, it was everything about that. And the one last thing I will say, not to take up too much time, um, but I wanna really ground us in that to say where you are now, you don't know where you could be in the future. There's no way I would have ever thought 10 years ago I could be up here. There was no way 10 years ago I thought I would turn it at that Kiki ball that I went to uh, earlier this year. That was crazy. And I say it because ballroom, not only it gave me an identity, it gave me a space, it gave me a, a way to connect with people, to feel community, to feel family. And it also, it gave me a calling in so many ways. I would not be the person I am here today without it. And that said, I have taken ownership over that. And because one of the big things that the, the, the reason why I wrote that article was I started doing oral histories of the community back then. Because the thing that pissed me off, right, I was in academia, I saw all these gender studies, these white girls, they all watch Paris is Burning, they read that one article from Bell Hooks and that one article from Judith Butler from 30 fucking years ago, and they build an entire career off of nothing. Darling, we live in the information age. Listen. I know, I'm about to preach. I will give the mic back. What bothered me, we live in the information age. You have no excuse. You could Google people. You could look it up. There's been so many articles written about our community. I was like, why, has no, why have none of these people talked to the people I know, the, the icons I see on YouTube? What the fuck is this? And that was my moment to be like, oh, if nobody else is doing it, 
I need to be the one who does it. So I want us to also remember, remember your power and remember that you have the power to also not only take from ballroom, but give back to it too. You know what I'm saying? I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing so honestly and open. I was speaking over there to Baby and I could tell that she was very touched <laughs> also. Um, as am I, you are um, your mother. Um, you are the overall mother of the House of Prada. You have a lot of, <laughs> huh? I guess not, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and um, you have a lot of trans children. Um, I want to talk a little bit before we wrap this up about like, allyship and what your thoughts are on like what needs to be provided like um how we can um especially as those who have like are in a situation of like leading and leading children um to cater to the needs and be aware and how to be a good ally to um the needs especially of like trans children that one has hello everyone let me first say thank you for having me. Um, this has been such a great experience. Like, I've totally enjoyed myself my whole time being here. So I just wanted to say thank you again for having me. <laughs> so like Sophie said, my name is Baby Garcon. I'm the overall mother of the House of Garcon. I've been walking balls since 95, 96. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am a cisgendered heterosexual woman. Um, I was approached at a fashion show, I used to model professionally. I was approached at a fashion show by my father, uh, Bernie Jordan, and the way he explained it to me was, hey, I think you're beautiful, you know, could you come walk this fashion show for me? And I'm like, okay, you need to talk to my mom. Um, and let's see what my mom says. So the way I was, pushed into ballroom. I'm thinking, I'm showing up, I'm thinking I'm coming to a fashion show, I got my bags of shoes, you know. I was like, okay, I'm coming to a fashion show. And I'm like, when is this fashion show gonna start? Because I've been sitting here for hours. So, <laughs> so finally they call the category that's called Woman's Runway. And they're like, okay, baby, you're on, it's your turn. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? And he's like, just walk. So Jack was commentating that night, and he said to me, um, I'm walking, and I hear the, you know, tens across the board, and then I hear the keep walking. And I'm like, huh? Uh -uh. It's a fashion show, I'm done, like, you know? <laughs> so he's like, keep walking. And I remember that night, as a kid, I don't know if some of you can relate, as a kid, I was always told that I was weird. Um, no one could really get my idea process. I always thought, so to say, out of the box. So when I arrived at that ball, and I felt like I was, ah, uh, uh, I finally arrived. You know, someone gets me. Someone gets my effects when it comes to walking woman's runway. Someone gets when I say to them, I want to paint my body all black and put a unicorn horn on my head. Someone gets that I want to walk in a bubble. You know, you get me. Thank you. Thank you for accepting me, this cisgendered heterosexual woman, mother of three. Th thank you. Um, so, <laughs> so to be honored to with the being asked to be the mother of a house. I started as being the mother of the house of Jordan, and then I was asked to be the mother of the house of Quran. And then from there, I was asked to be the mother of the house of Balenciaga, turn that down. Um, but then I was asked to be the mother of the mother, the overall mother of the house of Garcon. And when I say that, and not because it's my house, when I say that, it is an honor and a pleasure to be the mother of, of such a diverse, very unique, talented bunch of individuals that has this, as Shady Prada said, this 
fuck you, fuck what you think, this is what it is, and this is how it's gonna happen. And I'm so honored to be the voice of, I'm gonna say heterosexual people are very ignorant when it comes to the LGBTQ community. Um, I get the questions of, why do you want, you know, why are you doing this? Like, uh, what are you getting out of it? Um, are you low key, you know, a, a homosexual? Or do you not want to come out of the closet? Are you confused? <laughs> and my thing is, if, you, if the heterosexual community is ignorant to what's going on, I have no problem with being the voice. I have no problem of uh, educating, educating you on what's going on. Um, I look at it as there's no separate, you know, we're all one, we're all living this world, you know. We all should be more accepting and understanding of each other. Just because you're one way or whatever your preference is or whatever you choose doesn't make me any better, doesn't make you any better. We're all one. So I just want to say thank you for that as well. <laughs> So when I was asked to be the overall mother of the House of Garçon, um, I took it very seriously. Um, I don't know if, if she could speak to this. I treat them as I treat my own children. I have three boys, 23, 20, and 15. So there's no, oh, let me, so to say, well, if father said no, let me call mom. Mom will say, yeah. No, I'm hooked to it. So I treat, I, I, I come to them, I don't know if she could, she could speak to it. I'll come to you and say, well, what did your father say? Or why do you want to do this? Or why are you asking me this? So I, I feel like you should have an understanding when it comes to being a mother. There's more than the title. I like to say that I sit in it. I sit in my position. I give you the good and the bad. I'll give you the... As I said, I treat them like I treat my own children. I'll say to you, okay, if you wanna go out there, I'm not gonna push you out there, I'm gonna tell you what it is first. And it's more than ballroom to me. You know, if you call me and say, hey, I need a place to lay my head because my birth parents are not getting what I'm going through. I tell them, call me, I don't care what time of day it is, what time of night it is, call me. I'm not gonna rub your back and tell you you're pretty. I'm gonna, you know, ask you what's going on with it and how we can, how can we, we can resolve the issue or how can I help you? And I'm not just gonna say, hey, come walk this ball and put these shoes on and paint your face and you look pretty. What are you doing with your life? Are you, are you in school? Are you working? What do your grades look like? Um, how are you mentally? Because that's play, that plays a, mo, a more, a, like a, a, a very important role. And I don't think a lot of mother and fathers, so to say in barroom, get that. That mentally, mentally, you need to be there. Sometimes you just need someone to listen. Not as opposed to giving your opinion. Sometimes you just want someone to listen. To, you know, to to try to understand what it is they're going through, you know, with their day-to-day -day health. Sometimes I need someone to listen to me, you know? So, I t like, I, like I said, I take it personally. I'm, I'm concerned with your health. I'm concerned with your mental. Um, I'm concerned with, like I said, your grades and your education. If you're working, if you're not working, then what do I need to do? Do I need to prep you on how to have an interview? Do I need to prep you on what to wear to an interview? Do I need to prep you on how us, we can get you some type of health benefits? Or do I need to, if I have to, do I need to go sit with your parents and you know, ask them what it is that you don't understand? Maybe I can help you understand because I am a parent. I am a mother. I can, you know, maybe we can talk and we can figure some things out, you know? So it goes, being a parent goes beyond ballroom. You know, if you're gonna be a mother or you're gonna be the father, it's, you know, it's fab to get your little 10 minutes of fame when they call you out for legend statements and stars. But what are you doing beyond that for the community? What are you doing beyond that? And I don't like to say kids because they're adults that are in houses 
you know, ballroom is supposed to be fun. Ballroom is supposed to be an extracurricular activity. You know, ballroom is supposed to be a, a safe place where you can come express your talents. And ballroom has gone, I think it has gone above and beyond that. It's, it's not that. You get the, just to piggyback off of what um, this gentleman here said, you get the, I don't want to walk balls anymore. Or I went to this ball, like this young lady said, I went to this ball and I was told, oh my God, what are you doing? Don't wear that. Or uh, you look this way, or you shouldn't look this way, or you would win more balls, as guy said, if you would do this, or you would walk this way, or you would present yourself in this way. And that's not always the thing. You know, try to understand, try to empathize with the, what's, what's going on in today's society. And I think that of a way that we can get there, if we do more panels like this, you know, if we put it out there, we put it in their face that this is what it is, this is what's happening, and we're not going anywhere. And I say we, because as I said before, even though I am a heterosexual woman, I'm one, I'm, we're, we're one. Thank you so much. So this is an ongoing conversation. <laughs> an ongoing conversation and I want to make very clear that this is not a conversation that um, although I'm very thankful um, for the things that we received on the end of House of Saint Laurent, um, I again really want to say thank you specifically to Litchi Saint Laurent and Georgina Saint Laurent for organizing the festival. I also really want to thank Ria Saint Laurent who is organizing the Kiki Ball, which is about to start, which is why we have to wrap this up, unfortunately, although this is an ongoing conversation, but we really have to wrap this up <laughs> so that you can get your little trophies and everything. But um, yes, uh, I also wanna really make clear and say again that like, this is not a conversation, however, we're trying to like give space for the conversation, but that is not a conversation that we started. It is a conversation that we joined. And to always remember like, you join a conversation that other people have been fighting for and maybe um, nobody, they never got their flowers or ne nobody ever said thank you to them. So we are just joining a conversation um, that other people have been doing the work for a long, long time, many, many years, like, um, yeah, just for us to like remember that, that even if you do like a little thing, um, that is that it will never be enough compared to if we go back to the beginning of the evening to that uh, to those statistics that we saw to the stories that were shared here on stage to all the stories that are unheard to all the realities that we never will learn about so if like the pains everything so with that being said I want to thank you all so much so much for coming here, for taking your time, for sharing everything, sharing your knowledge, sharing your stories. Um, I need to let you know that everyone except um, the participants of the ball have to exit the building um, because there are many people here who do not have a ball ticket yet. So you have to go outside and then if you want to join the ball then you will have to see if you can still join the ball but if you don't have a ticket then it's your time it was beautiful with you but then now is your time to leave <laughs> um thank you so much thank you so much